بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام رسول الله watching Islam tomorrow and we're going to be talking today on the subject of women and by the way I'm not a woman but I'm going to be talking about women as <laughs> your host Yusuf Estes we'd like to invite you to visit our internet website Islam tomorrow for more like this we have the discussions there the articles are there and the rebroadcasts of our programs are at alternate website islamyesterday.com now I got all the commercials out of the way I'm ready to go to work I want to talk about the subject of the role of the women in Islam and the role of the Muslim ladies and to give us some idea about this I want to refer to the condition of women prior to Islam before Islam came what was the condition of women men have traditionally been the big guys right and they're always taking advantage of their physical size and their ability to manipulate those who are smaller than they are and very frequently women suffer as a result of that even today but in particular before Islam came we have to know that the role of the women was not really that great women were, were really oppressed heavily and by the way in Islam oppression is something forbidden it's wrong to ever oppress but before I get to the general topics like that I want to kind of set the stage when I talk about the role of the women by giving you a little historical background several thousand years ago whoever contributed to some of the words of the Bible mentioned that Adam had eaten the fruit but as a uh, the effect is not from him it's blaming his wife Eve it's blaming her because she succumbed to the devil listened to him and she ate the fruit and she goes and tricks her husband into eating the fruit as such according to the book of Genesis in the Bible she's cursed for that it doesn't curse Adam for disobeying Allah but it does curse her for getting him to eat the fruit it continues by saying that because of this she will be punished all women will be punished because of this they're all going to suffer because of what she did and it will be that she will have her monthly courses and it calls it the curse and so women today even now call this the curse and also having pain in childbirth all of this is part of the punishment for the women for their participation in having Adam disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God Almighty by eating the fruit as a result of that the church in the seventh century was convening a council to decide whether or not a woman even had a soul because traditionally the church teaches that it's better for you not to not to associate with women not to get married unless you just really have to this is the presentation given in the new testament advising that the young men that don't you know don't be with women but if you have to you can get married but it's better to be without them even it says for the man it's better for him to mutilate himself than to be with a woman and I think some of you know what I'm talking about it's pretty serious some men took that literally and in the second century one of the monks of the time actually cut off his private parts because he said it'd be better than to have to be with a woman this is the setting for the kind of thing that we see today where the monks the priests have no wives through their whole life the nuns have no husbands through their whole life and they consider that something good that's holy that's sacred to them so now let's move forward a little bit to the time of Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him what was the condition of the women in the Arab community prior to the advent of Islam it was horrible it was really horrible the women had no rights and they weren't permitted to speak up they weren't allowed to own any property they were inherited against their will if they were a, an orphan child someone would claim her and say I'll marry this girl even if she's two or three months old they're gonna say I'm gonna marry her just to get the wealth away from the family they did things like that and they had no limit on how many wives they could have so anytime they wanted to take over a woman or her possessions they just say I'll take this lady and what you gonna do about it and if a man wanted to give his daughter away in marriage she could be to anybody that he wanted to and the girl had nothing to say about this she had no rights whatsoever now Islam comes okay let's find out what does Allah say about this subject in the Quran there are 114 chapters 
one of them is dedicated by name to women. It's called Surah An-Nisa. That means the chapter of the women. It spells out a lot of things about women's rights. I'm going to be quoting to you from the Quran, but it will be translation to English. I'll try to give references by numbers as much as I can, so if you'd like to check this out for yourself, we welcome that. If you'd like to have the Quran in the English language, with the Arabic beside it, along with the capability of using English letters to give the transliteration or pronunciation of the Arabic words, we have it online, free. You can get it at our website, islamtomorrow.com, and then Click on the tab that says free and you'll be able to see this for yourself. Chapter 4. We're going to begin with that. The beginning of chapter 4 of the Quran or An-Nisa, the women, immediately starts addressing the issue of dealing with orphan girls and warning the believers about how they mistreat these poor little orphan girls and instructs them not to mix these girls' wealth like it's in trust, you have a trust or a mana, don't mix that with your own wealth trying to improve your condition. And so this is what's stated talking about the yatim or the orphan girls. Then it continues that if you fear that you're going to, you can't control yourself, you just feel like, oh, I, I want to get married to this girl and it's because of, you know, this or that. The real thing is you want to do that because you want her wealth. So Allah said in there, marry other girls of your choice. Don't marry these girls. These are orphan girls. Don't marry them. They're, and they're too young anyway. Don't do that. Look what it says. Marry other girls of your choice. And he uses the term two in Arabic. Three, four. And that's the limit. Now, a lot of people don't realize this. Islam brings rights, yes, but it also brings limits. And I'd like you to explore with me this right and this limit at the same time. Because it stops at four, right away the companions understood that's the limit. Many of them had more than four wives. They had to divorce them. But then it continues with another limit. If you can treat them with equality, otherwise you can only have one. If you can't treat them equally, if you can't provide for them equally, you're not allowed to have four. And if you can't handle three, then you can't have that. And if you can only take care of one and be really straight honest about this, really providing for her fair, then that's all you can do. This is the limit set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. Read it for yourself. So the men at that time understood this limit. Four? Only four. They didn't like today people said, four, wow. No, they said four, oh no. Because they had to get divorces. Many of them did that. So this is something serious. You need to look at that. And then you see that you have to treat them with equality. What's happened, natural attrition, I guess, over the centuries, last 1400 years, Muslim men today are the most monogamous on earth, even though they have permission to have more than one wife. Yet they have only one, most. Some have two, some have three, some have four. But this is rare. It's actually very rare. In fact, for us Muslim men, it's a joke. And somebody joked with me today about that. We were out visiting some people. We were in Amish country. We saw some Muslims over there. And the first thing they joked with me, Oh, you're an American. How many wives do you have? <laughs> we always laugh because who has more than one wife? Very few times you hear about this. But I want to mention something for the non-Muslim to consider. In Islam, it's forbidden to have a girlfriend. There is no hanky-panky in Islam. Before marriage or after marriage, this doesn't exist legally. It can exist legally. It is illegal in Islam. It is not permissible to have a mistress or a girlfriend or a little fling on the side or a gee whiz, you know, I don't know what I was thinking about. No, 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 no. Does it work in Islam? And is, this is punishable. According to the judge, the boy who does such a thing can be punished, or a girl who does such a thing can be punished physically for such a horrible thing. Because it's considered disgraceful. It's a dishonor, it's disrespect to the woman that you would do such a thing. And by the way, just in case, just in case you didn't know this, 
whenever a woman, any woman, finds out that her husband is cheating, being with another woman, you know what the first words from her mouth is? I'll kill him. Yes? I'll kill him. This, and many women in this country have done so. They find their husband with some lady and they kill him. And the Bible tells them, kill the one who does this. And boy, they're good at it. Sometimes they poison him, sometimes they stab him, sometimes they shoot him, and sometimes they nag him to death. <laughs> but it's not permissible in Islam to have sex outside of marriage, to, you know, play around, things like this. This is disgusting. It's not even something we like to talk about, but it needs to be mentioned so people know what Islam is teaching about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, is the one who created man and women. And we need to set this out now before we go any farther. He did not create them equal. And we don't say that men are equal to women or women are equal to men. And who says such a thing is just playing with words. They are playing. This is a joke. There is not equality between men and women in Islam, but there is equity. Be sure you understand the difference between these two words. Equity means that you're going to get your rights. And this is what Islam is about, getting your rights. Yes, sir, but also staying within your limits at the same time. Can a man have a baby? Of course not. Does a man have to go through this pain and agony for nine months of carrying this child and having his body distorted all over the place? No, he doesn't have to put up with that. And the pain of giving birth is such that a woman can't even describe it to a man. She can't even begin to tell him what it feels like, the pain to have this baby. I remember my own wife told me one time, I said, Wow, you grabbed my finger while she's having a birth pain. She grabbed my hand so bad I thought she was going to break my finger. I said, What in the world pain is this that makes you do that? She said, No way I can tell you. I said, I'd like to have some idea. She said, Take your lip, your bottom lip, okay? Can you catch it? I said, yeah. She said, now pull it up over the top of your head. <laughs> and you won't even begin to understand the pain yet. Any ladies had babies, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I don't know, but I can do that. She said, there you go. So let us understand from the beginning that a woman, she has things that she endures every day and men don't even have a clue. Men, we get a paper cut. <laughs> and we go to her, oh, I got a bobo. Oh, and we make a big deal from it. And she says, oh, you poor thing. Here, let me kiss it. And put a little band-aid over it. Are you okay? Even she'll ask you later, how's your finger? How are you doing? In the meantime, you didn't ask how she's doing. She's having all kind of pain. But we didn't care. Because we saw our mother, she endured pain, so we never ask our mother. You ever ask your mother how you feel? How's everything? Are you okay? Do you have some pain or anything? No. That's mom. Hey, she don't have any pain. <laughs> we don't realize. But look what Allah tells us. Now I'm going to jump out of the surah on this side. I have to leave this surah for a minute. I want to go to another chapter in the Quran, number 31, surah Luqman. When uh, Luqman, the man of wisdom, was talking to his son, and Allah was talking about how important was the words of wisdom that he was giving his son. Telling him, don't worship anybody but Allah. By the way, that's what Islam is really about. Anytime we have a program, we need to always mention what is Islam. Islam is to worship Allah without partners. Doing what Allah wants you to do instead of what you want to do. That's what's Islam. Set that forward before we do anything else. Now coming back to this subject. Here, uh, this man of wisdom is telling his son, don't set up partners in worship with Allah. And after that, the first obedience, and Allah said it in the Quran, is to obey your parents. And which parent did he refer to first? And he talked in depth about it. He said, your mother. And he talked about the pain, the agony, the suffering that the mother goes through. And he repeated it again in Arabic to show how much suffering the woman is going through to have this child and how much right that gives her over her son. This is in the Quran. Showing how much the woman's right is over her child. Even then, he says, Allah said in the Quran, you obey them, especially talking about the mother again, obey your parents in everything except, and then Allah gave the limit. 
unless they want you to set up partners with me in worship. This you don't have permission to do. But even if they do that, you can't do it, but still you have to serve them, honor them, and be kind to them. Another place in the Quran, Allah tells us about the treatment of our parents. It's so important how we treat them that even when they get old and infirm and they're, you know, sometimes people will come and their head a little soft. We say it's uh, like uh, Alzheimer's disease. My father had it. When they get in this condition and you have to take care of them, you have to feed them, you have to take them to the bathroom, like a baby, you're taking care of them, and maybe you get tired and fed up, you still, Allah said, even you can't say oof. Even don't say oof. If you do, this is something horrible and Allah doesn't like it. They took care of you, now it's your turn to take care of them. It's very serious in Islam, the treatment of the parents. And, if you, and especially, I keep going back to women, because the Prophet, now we're going to talk about a hadith. This is where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he tells us something very important. When a man had carried his own mother on his back, he carried his mother on his back, walking around, took her around, circumambulating the Kaaba in Mecca, going around with his mother on his back as an act of worship. Seven times he came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he said to him, have I now fulfilled my mother's rights on me? Look what I did for her. You know what he said? He said, not even for one birth pain. You haven't even fulfilled that. Another man, he came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he said, after Allah and his messenger, who has the most rights over me? He said, your mother. He said, and then who? Your mother. And then your mother and then your father. The parents have the most rights. And look how the emphasis again is on the woman. And it's not because that the woman here is better than the man, but it's because the men of the time had never given this kind of respect to women before, so it was highly emphasized so that you could see how important that the role of the woman is. There's equity here. And we have to respect the women, respect the mother, respect the honor and dignity of this great station. Now, some people, they have harsh, harsh attacks against Islam. And sometimes their attacks against Islam will bleed over into the Muslim community and some Muslims, ignorant Muslims, will pick this up and start to say something wrong and say things out of ignorance against Islam. And that's sad why a Muslim would speak against their own religion. But it happens. And may Allah guide them and put them in the right way. Because a Muslim, we still pray for them. No matter how much mistakes they make, you have to pray for them. And I'm doing that for myself too because I make a lot of mistakes I want to think about this for a minute now and come to today right now I talked about thousands of years ago I talked about the time of the prophet peace be upon him I want to talk about right now when people come to us and say things like while Islam is teaching that men can marry little girls and they say really harsh things about this and they say bad words against our prophet peace be upon him and I'm not going to use those words against our prophet not just because I'm here in the masjid, but also because I'm not going to use those words with our Prophet. What they use as evidence when they bring this subject up is something they saw on the internet. There are people, Arabs, not Muslims, who have put things on the internet, twisted things around, and then said, look how this is Islam. Because they hate Islam themselves. So they want other people to dislike it and attack the Muslims and justify, oh, it's okay to kill Muslims because after all, they are not even good people, they're bad, they do this, they do that. And in particular, I'm talking now about when they say, what do you say about a 53-year-old man having sex with a six-year-old girl? Allah. May Allah forgive me for even mentioning this. And where do they get this from? Most of you, you know something called Sahih al-Bukhari. This is the, one of the best, if not the best, collections of the accurate and the authenticated sayings and teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. After the Quran, it's probably one of the most accepted teachings of Islam, is this great work which is close to 3,000, I think, hadith in there, and highly researched by Imam Bukhari. Now, in there, there is a hadith stating the age of Aisha at six years old. And when you translate it to English, and then take the English and then leave part of it out and add some other words that aren't there, you can make it look really bad. 
You can, but the words are not there, not in Arabic. I don't care what translation you have, it's not there in Arabic. What it says, I'm going to share this story with you. I'm going to tell you how to answer somebody when they come with that. Instead of just trying to give them the information I'm going to give you, start out like this and say, thank you for asking me about my religion. They'll be shocked. Um, what? They didn't come to ask you about Islam. They came to start trouble, right? <laughs> but you smile and say, thank you for asking me about my religion because this is the way of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you used to always take in consideration the people, give them benefit of the doubt, treat them kind, and present his case in a good way. Yes or no? Yes, he did. All right. Now, thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, we have proof. We have the proof. It's preserved. Everything we know about Islam, we still have it today. The Quran is still 100% intact in the Arabic language. We don't have to question, maybe it said this, maybe it said that. The second thing is, we have to speak the truth. As a Muslim, if I lie, I can go to hell forever. So I'm not going to lie to you. I have to tell you the truth. And even if I told you a lie, you could verify it. You could just go back and see because everything about Islam is authenticated. So check for yourself. Okay? But now let me say this before I give you the answer to your question. Sometimes people, they make statements with a question mark. They're not questions. They're statements. And sometimes their statement isn't true. Then what do you want me to do with it? I always like to give this one. Suppose somebody said, can you answer a question about your mother? It's a yes or no question. You go, yeah, I can. Is your mother out of jail yet? He said, well, my mother's never been in. No, no, yes or no. Is she out of jail yet? Well, yes. Oh, I'm glad she got out. But she's never been in jail. You see, trick question. So let them understand that some of these things are not right because they're statements with a lie in the statement and now how am I going to deal with that? So before I'm going to answer your question, I'm going to straighten it out. Okay? Next, if while well, I'm giving you the answer to the question, you hear something that you say, oh, that's nice, I didn't know that, I like that, that's good for me. If you hear any of those things coming out of your mouth, I'm going to ask you, will you then be ready to worship your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord, alone without any partners? Because you see, that's all Islam is about. Worshipping God on His terms. Now I'd like to give you the answer if you're ready. They go, okay. I saw it many times. They, they're just shocked because they weren't thinking you're going to be so prepared. And this is good preparation. You're calm, you're cool, you're collected. You're not reacting. Don't be a reactionary. Don't be a reactionary. Don't let the shaitan trick you into acting like a fool. Be calm and say, thank you for asking me about my religion. Then begin. Now, first of all, Islam, you ask, what does Islam say about an old man having sex with a little girl? It's haram. Simple as that. Because it's haram for a man to have sex with any girl without marriage. So we'll answer a question they didn't ask. You didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you, there is no sex in Islam except legitimized contractual and understood and accepted terms. The girl has to accept and she has to be old enough to accept. And a six-year-old girl isn't old enough to accept. Therefore, it's not acceptable. Okay? Simple as that. They're shocked. Because you gave them something. You know, they didn't know. In Islam, a man who does such a horrible thing can be punished severely for this. Horribly punished for having such a thing. It's not, it's not something he can say, oops, I, I'm sorry. No, no. It doesn't work like that. All men have to know to have the respect for the women. All women. But especially children. This is not acceptable. Now, let's go to the Hadith in Bukhari. Is that fair? The Hadith in Bukhari talks about Aisha from Aisha's standpoint. She's the one telling us what it says. Aisha says... I was outside playing in the dirt with her dolls or toys or something like that, with her friends, okay? So I'm going to ask you before I go any further, do you accept what Aisha says? Will you accept her testimony? I do because I'm a Muslim. But do you? Or could this be somebody who's lying? Because if she's lying, she's the only one that tells the story. 
So I'm going to ask you, are you going to accept her testimony? And he goes, yeah, sure, why not? Will you accept all of her testimony or just what you want to hear? Because if she lies, then she's not a reliable witness. Do you accept everything she says, yes or no? I do. And he's going, uh, I guess so. Well, she also said, la ilai la la. Accept that? She said, there's only one God worthy to be worshipped. Do you accept that? Uh, well, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> okay. Well, you think about that while I go on. She tells us that her mother came to her while she was playing. Who? Her mother. Her mother took her into the house to talk to her father. Her father is sitting with his lifelong friend, his best friend since they were kids. His friend, which is Muhammad the Prophet The father is offering to marry her to Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Did you understand that? I want to repeat that because I think a lot of you guys, you stand in the checkout line at the Safeway and read that tabloid trash so much that you're mixing what you're reading there with something that's very real here in Islam. This is a marriage proposal. A father and a mother are offering their daughter in marriage, which was the custom of the day. Everybody knew that. A, a two-year-old daughter could be offered in marriage at that time. Nobody thought anything about that. That was normal. The marriage offer was there for Muhammad sallallahu She said that. Then she said she went back outside to play with her toys. Yes or no? Well, does that sound like she got married? Where did you hear the word sex in there? Did you hear the word sex? No. So why did you say that? Why did you say that? Why did you turn a marriage proposal, which obviously was not consummated, wasn't accepted, otherwise why is she out there playing with her toys? How come she didn't go off with him? Because in the same Sahih Bukhari, we find another hadith that when she was much older, the proposal came again. And again, the father made the offer to Muhammad Sallallahu peace be upon him, to get married to his daughter. And this time it was accepted. But it was a father and mother offering their daughter in marriage to someone who was very highly honored and respected and one of their best friends and their families knew each other. So what is your problem? This is called marriage. Something that a lot of people in this country forgot about. They had no respect for. But Islam is insisting on this marriage. Now, the next thing to know is that again it's Aisha who tells us about their relationship. When she went to live with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what was the first thing they did? First thing. First thing. They played together. He said that. Now we're going to talk about what he said. He says that and she says that. They played together. He even advised his friends, if you marry a young virgin girl like this, then you should play with her. Take time. And they used to run. She said, I used to beat him in a race. And then later years when I got older and heavier, he used to beat me in the races. She talked about many things that they did together. Then she talks about sex. Let me tell you about this. Aisha happens to be the number one scholar for women in all of Islam. That's a fact. No other woman has given us so much information about the things about women. No man has given us anything compared to what Aisha has done either. So we consider her more than just a scholar because our prophet told us that she was the mother of the believers. Yet she never had any children. Yes. Now I want to keep going because we've got several other topics here. But I'd like for you to know that if you would take all the stories that she said about her relationship with Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the stories that he said about her, this is a love story. A big love story. So much so that after he passed away, you know she never got married. In fact, she was never seen out in public again after that, except that she would be totally covered. Even her face was covered. Yes, that's a fact. Because this is something very important that she feels I need to live up to. And it was what Allah wanted to do. And she's obeying Allah. 
She lived many years after him and shared her experiences and, ex and especially she shared what the teachings were for a man and woman to be together. How to be intimate with each other. How to love each other. How to caress each other. And how to have a good experience sexually together. And she explained it in such detail that nothing since then has been equal to the teaching of Islam in this intimate relationship. Even the research done by Masters and Johnson in the 1970s in the book which is called Everything You Want to Know About Sex But Was Afraid to Ask doesn't compare with the research that she offered us 1400 years ago. And it's very beautiful. So much so that I challenge these people when they come to me I challenge him. Let us take these hadiths and let us remove the names so that nobody will know who we're talking about and remove the dates and remove the places so nobody will know where. But then take the story, all of these hadiths, even from the Quran, because Allah defended Aisha in the Quran and Surah Nur. Take it. Take the whole story and go to any psychologist or psychiatrist or social worker or counselor that you know and ask them to read this and give you their response. And you know what they're going to say. And you know it and I know it. They're going to say, Wow, this is too good to be true. This is the love story of all love stories. This is the story that Shakespeare wanted to write when he wrote Romeo and Juliet, but he wound up making them commit suicide at the end. In our story, everybody lives happily ever after in the Jannah. And then that counselor, psychiatrist, psychiatrist, or social worker is going to turn to you and say, this is the relationship you wish you had. And what will you say then? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or would you like to have a relationship where your wife never spoke bad of you because she never spoke bad against her husband? How many women can say that today that they never spoke evil against their husband? Huh? And after he died, she never spoke against him. And how many women could say that? And she never looked at another man for sex or anything like that. And how many women today in this country, and they know they can't hold their head up when you say something like that. If you know the truth behind these stories, you can't accept people to talk this way. But you need to have respect and show them the right way. And by the way, I've had so many of them say, gee, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Gee whiz, that does sound nice. I would like to. I wish. Do you wish you had a relationship where a woman was true to you no matter what? and would stand by you no matter what, even after you're dead and gone, she'd still stand beside you? Yes, of course you do. And by the way, do you remember when we started our little talk, I told you if you heard anything that made you say, gee, I like that for me, this is something good, that you might consider worshiping Allah alone without any partners? Do you remember that? Well, maybe it's time now that you say, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, Ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Watch their face. <laughs> Next. Today we also have, I'm going to stay with the subject of women. We also have some very harsh attacks coming from people claiming to be Muslim. Whether they are or not, Allah knows best. Well, I'm not going to make that call. I don't need to do that. You know, the last thing I need to do is say somebody's kafir. I don't need to say that. But I can say there's a big question mark on people who say and do certain things. And I'm going to avoid those people. But I'm not going to be stupid. I'm going to find out what I can about them so that I can help other people to avoid the same thing. And in particular, I'm talking about one woman who went around the country saying a lot of bad things against Islam and claimed to be a Muslim at the same time. She did a lot of bad things. And she said, this is bad, Islam is bad, oppressed to women, blah, blah, blah. But then it comes out that she is a homosexual. She only wants to be sexually with women. Islam forbids this in the Quran. And the Bible forbids this very clearly in the book of Genesis when it talks about Kaumulut, the people of Lot. The Bible tells them to kill people who do this and tells you how to kill them. The Bible, their book. Our book doesn't say it like that. 
What we know though, this is despicable in the sight of Allah because He created a man and a woman to be together to have children. Not a man and a man or a woman and a woman. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. Yet this woman is that way and she's cursing Islam. Saying she doesn't agree with Islam. Well, I guess not because Islam is speaking against her. But this woman published a lot of stuff and unfortunately a lot of women picked up on what this lady was saying and they began to repeat some things not knowing that this woman was really such a deviant person. Then another woman comes along and she's claiming to be a professor of Islam. She's a teacher. She gets paid for it, so she's a professor. And she's saying to the people that Oh, a woman can give speeches on Friday, the Juma, the sermon on Friday. And a woman can lead the Salat, is what she said. And a lot of women again said, oh yeah, we need equal rights. Without realizing, when you do that, you give up your equity. And you don't want to do that. Because Allah perfected your deen, your way of life for you, 1400 years ago. I asked the women today in another program I was talking about, would you like to give up the right to keep all your money? Because in Islam, women don't have to support men, but men have to support women. And all the women agreed, no, I don't want to give that up. That's a good right. <laughs> I'll keep that. Women have the right to be supported and protected by men, starting with their father, their brother, their husband, and their sons. And if they don't have any family, the rest of the male community is responsible to take care of those women because women never have to go out and get a job. They never have to go out and support themselves. And there's no such thing in Islam as a woman living underneath a, br a bridge with one of those shopping carts or a bag lady. This is horrible and totally out of Islam. Islam is providing for the women. Now, if men don't do it, Allah will punish them for that. But it's a woman's right. Did you want to throw that right away? I don't think so. So be careful when you start talking about this change some things because you don't realize you can make a change you can like. What is the status of the woman in worship in Islam? Allah tells us very clearly, and I'm going to go to another chapter of the Quran, chapter 33 of Hasab, chapter 33, verse 35. In chapter 35, it tells a beautiful way it, when Allah is talking about the believer man and the believing woman, and He uses it in Arabic so that you can hear it in a beautiful way. Al-Mu'minun wa mu'minat. A Muslimun wa Muslimati. But in the translations, to save space, the translators say it's not the Muslim men and women, the believing men and women, the fasting men and women, the charity giving men and women. They summed it together, but in Arabic it doesn't say that. It says the believing men and the believing women, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the fasting men and the fasting women, the charity giving men and the charity giving women, the patient men and the patient women, because Allah is making sure you understand that men and women are the same in front of Him when it comes to worship. There isn't any difference. Allah looks in the heart of both. And then in the next verse, it's very important because he took all the verse 35 to set you up for verse 36 when he said it is not for the believing man nor for the believing woman that when Allah and his messenger have decided any matter that they have any other opinion, but they take it. And they have no resistance to the decision of the Prophet Now figure that one out. It's very clear men and women have this high status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the responsibility at the same time. So it isn't appropriate. It's wrong for a man or a woman to go against the teachings of the Quran or the Prophet, peace be upon him. That's the way Allah said it, not me. Now, when we come to the area where the man is different from the woman, then Allah provided for that. When it comes to the Salat, we want to talk about Salat. Salat is not prayer. Anybody can pray anywhere they want to. That's just raise your hands. Oh God, I need this, I need that. Uh, we call that Dua. Dua, that's any place, any time, no problem. Dua, that's what Christians know about. They don't have Salat. Did you see Christians do Salat? No. Don't call Salat prayer. Explain to them this is a thing called Salat, which is a special worship that used to be reserved for prophets. And it's in your book. They used to stand and bow and fall on their face. Exactly what we do today. No different. 
They face towards Jerusalem, just as Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, used to do before the Qibla was changed by Allah in the Quran. And so what's new? Nothing! Except men and women both get to do this, and the women didn't used to do that. But after Islam came, Allah had it so men and women, all the people in Islam can do this beautiful thing called Salah. And the Prophet's companions were excited and happy when the order came because they, they had not had this before. They loved it. They understood what it meant. It's your connection that you can speak directly to Allah without intercession, without going to a priest, without going to somebody in the grave and asking them for something. You can go directly to Allah with this thing called Salah. But Allah knows there's a difference between men and women. Women have children, little small babies. Women are cooking. Women are taking care of these children. Women are taking care of the house. They're doing a lot of work. Men don't. Men have work they do. I'm not saying we don't work. A lot of stuff we do we call work anyway. But Allah ordered the men to go every Friday to the prayer regardless. Drop your business. Drop your, your tijara. Your, uh, you know trading. Leave it and go and be in the masjid. Because there's words there you need to hear. And then when a man's able to, he should go five times a day for the prayer if he's able at the masjid. He should go there. And the women should encourage the men to go and be in the masjid for the fajr salah, the morning, the noon, the afternoon, especially in the evening, and for sure to be there at night because that's where the big reward is for the men. And protection against being a monophic, a hypocrite. That's for the men, but not for the women. For the women, Allah made it real easy. They get more reward at home. And even more reward in their own bedroom or closet. They have most reward for them. They don't have to stop everything and go do that because Allah knows they're trying to do so much at home. How could they get all fixed up and covered up and go out there and come back five times a day? So Allah already made for that. It's in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, And Allah already told us in the Quran, you have to obey him. And that's what he told the women. You'll get your reward there. Why would a woman say, well, I want to give up my reward with Allah. I want to get less and go to the masjid and do that. Why would you want to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Now, the men should encourage the women to go for the Jummah Salah or any kind of program where there's going to be education because she needs to hear it too. That he should encourage, but he can't force her. The two Eids or the Eidain, talking about the festival of uh, Eid al-Adha, which is after the pilgrimage, and the Eid al-Fitr, which is after the fasting of the month of Ramadan. On these two occasions, you are supposed to really push her to go for that. Yes, but no other time do you have to really put the pressure on her, except these two times. She should go, because that's good for the Muslim ladies to get out and see each other, be together. Children should go. It should be a great gathering in a great place, a big place. Not necessarily the masjid could be out in a big, big gathering place. And that was what they did. That's what they understood. So why would a woman want to give up her rights for something less? Now, let's talk about can a woman give speeches? In general, I just told you Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, gave many speeches. I just told you that. She was a great scholar. But she did so from behind a protective wall or screen so that they didn't see her. And then she wouldn't have to put her cover on because she's behind the screen and she could talk to the people easily. And many people came and listened to her and she'd give lessons and everything. This is talking about men. Women could go and be with her all they want to because women don't have to cover in front of other women. Is that right? So it's not a problem. Okay, next. Can the woman lead the Salah? And again, the answer is yes, because at the time of Aisha, there were women leading Salah for other women and teaching the children. Yes. Should a woman lead the man in Salah? A, a sister just told me today, I like the petition because when I want to pray, I bend over. I don't want men looking at my behind. I don't want them seeing me like this is not good. My wife said the same thing. So how could she avoid that if she's in front of the men? The only exception to this, and we all know this is in the books of fiqh, is in the hajj. And only in the haram 
in Mecca because there are millions of people there. It's the only way you can perform the pilgrimage is because you have to keep your wife with you. You have to keep your daughters with you because it's very dangerous. They can get hurt real bad. They can get killed there. It happens. So you have to keep your family with you. And the only way you can do that when it comes time to pray, they pray next to you. It means that I prayed next to a lot of women. But by the way, the women don't nudge up against you and rub on your shoulder and things like that when you pray. No. They know that, that this is not respectful. And they pray and nobody's bothered by this because we're there for a lot. We're not there for any other purpose. Inshallah. Understand, that's the only exception. Everywhere else in the world, it's clear the women pray in a section for themselves. Their section is a protected place where men can't see them. So that if their hijab might fall, if their cover might fall away from them, if something might be showing, you know, that they couldn't help while they're in the prayer, the men won't know because the men are in front of them anyway. That makes sense. Why do you want to go against what Allah has for you? You got something better? Who would be stupid enough to say that I can invent a better universe than Allah? Nobody. So we understand that. Next. What about a woman giving the khutbah from the, for the Jummah? To stand up and give a speech. Well, in all cases that I read, and I spent some time to research it to find out because I don't know. I wasn't born a Muslim. Nobody just passed this off to me. I had to find out. There are books from Imams, great scholars of Islam, Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Malik, and Imam Ashafi, and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, and others, and all of them say the same thing. If there is not a man present for the Salat the Juma, there is no Salat the Juma. It's Duhr prayer. It's regular Duhr prayer, and this is what the Prophet taught. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught this. So how will you come with something new and say, well, I want to do this? If no man is there to give it, you don't do it. A child cannot give it. A woman cannot give it. It's time for the her prayer. You pray four rakah instead of two and go about your business. That's how it is. So who is this woman coming up and saying to us, Oh, that's okay, because you're a professor. By the way, some people think if I have more knowledge than somebody else, then I'm right. Knowledge never made anybody right. Whoever thinks knowledge will make you right, guess who your best friend became? Iblis. Audhu Billah. How much knowledge do you think Shaitan has? He was around before Adam and he's still around today. The devil is still around today. He's got the accumulated knowledge of thousands and thousands and thousands of years and it's not doing him any good at all because he won't use it the right way. So your knowledge is nothing. And Allah is telling us about his knowledge which is all encompassing of the past, the present, the future, and all, and you have no knowledge except what Allah lets you know. So who are we to come up and say, my knowledge, I know this, I know that. I'm probably the most ignorant person. And I hope, inshallah, Allah give me the right knowledge to use the right way, and no more than that. Because all I want to do is be successful here in the next life. And that should be everybody's attitude. Now let's do a little bit more discovery about this particular lady. I'm not mentioning names because if you don't know who it is, forget about it. But if you do know about it, you already know and I want to tell you. When they ask this woman who said that she wants to lead the Salat, she wants to give this khutbah, this sermon, they ask her about these things. They ask her, some things in the Quran don't match what you say. She said, anytime the Quran doesn't agree with my intelligence, I take my intelligence over the Quran. Whoops! You didn't know that part about this nice lady, did you? And what else did she say? And I read it on the internet, an interview with this lady, and they asked her, what about the Islamic law or Sharia? Which is a total way of government for the Muslims. She said, I don't like it. I prefer the government of Canada. <laughs> that's what she said and then when they asked her about homosexuality she said I'm for it and I like it guess what turns out she is a running buddy a mate with this other lady oh 
So now, my dear brothers and sisters, most respected in Islam, the question here is not whether or not a woman can give a khutbah. It's not whether or not a woman can lead the salah. And it's not even about whether this woman is a Muslim anymore. The question should be for us only one. Is she even a woman? Maybe she's a man. <laughs> Do the research before you make a conclusion. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I'm going to wrap it up with that. There's a lot more about women. We've got a number of programs on the internet. You can find it at a website called Light Upon Light, another website called Islam House, our websites, Islam Yesterday, Islam Tomorrow, Islam Always. All of these are dot com. I hope you'll take the time to do some research and find out the truth about the women in Islam. The women in Islam, one final point, I don't want you to miss this. I left it out by mistake. The woman said, can a woman be an imam? She wants to be the imam. And this is where she really went down, took herself out of a high status to low, even before she became homosexual. Oh yeah, I'm going to tell you why. Because imam for a man is only when he's leading salah. When he is leading salah, he is imam. It means the leader who stands in front. But as soon as he said, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah, Salaam alaikum, he's finished. The salah is over, he is not the imam. He can be the emir of your community, that's another job. He can be your teacher, yes. But actual job of imam is what? To lead the salah. Yes or no? All right, all right, wait. A woman, a woman, when she has a baby, in Arabic she's called what? Um. From what root? The same root as imam. And what did the Prophet ﷺ call the women of the believers? The handmaidens of Allah. The mothers of the believers. This is how he referred to his wives, yes or no? So if you have this title, um, as soon as you are a um, a mother, you stay in that position till the day of judgment. So you are a leader because you are the ones who are out in front and leading these children and you are the ones going to be sure that they stay in Islam. You have a very high honor in front of Allah. Why do you want to trade something high for something lower? I want to encourage our sisters to be closer to Allah. And realize, and most of you sisters, you know from very young age that we men have an ego problem. Don't jump in there and try to be in competition with us. Don't do that. That lowers you. And women know this. You know, isn't it true? How many times, ladies, I don't care if a person is a Muslim, a Christian, whatever, the women know this. That the first child a woman has is her husband. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. And that a man is nothing but a big little boy. Yes. Is that true? Yes. But a woman, as soon as she's old enough to even understand what a baby is, they start carrying I've seen five and six year old girls carrying little babies around trying to mother them. So a woman immediately understands, even at a young age, the importance of this role. The role of the woman in Islam is that of a queen. Now I want to close with this one final thing, is misinterpreting hadith. And may Allah protect us from this. Some brothers, and may Allah guide them, have taken hadith out of context. There's a hadith, famous story from Muhammad, peace be upon him. If I could order anyone to bow down to anyone other than Allah, it would be a woman to her husband. Have you heard that one? Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's to show how important it is for the woman to be obedient to her husband. Because this is also mentioned in ayah number 34 in the Quran. The obedience to the husband is after the obedience to Allah. Again, though, she can't obey him if it's against Islam. It's still the same rule. But, did you know there's another hadith? And the men don't promote this hadith at all. That says that in the Jannah, that when the woman, the wife that he had here, enters upon him, he's so amazed at this beauty, he thinks it's Allah, and he does make sajda to this woman. And she says, what are you doing? He said, you're so beautiful, I think you're Allah. She said, no, I am your wife from the dunya. 
Yes. Yeah, of course you're not going to hear that. Do you think we're going to tell you? Not popular to mention this, is it? You won't find it. Go. Go ask. Until you find a real scholar of Islam and they'll say, well, yeah, it's there. It's, it's, uh, it's not a famous city, but is it Sahih? Well, yeah, but it's not famous. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, no man wants to admit that I'm going to be bowing down to my own wife. Come on, guys. So take it easy. Everybody keep things in perspective. Keep the balance here. And you're going to be much happier. It's Allah that guides. Only Allah will guide you. If you want guidance, seek it from Him. And whenever you have a problem with your husband, or with your wife, or with any Muslim, remember this, that this is somebody who believes in Allah. And regardless of what your differences are, on the day of judgment, if you don't resolve your problem now with that person, you will not enter Jannah until you res resolve it outside that Jannah. And I don't want to be standing around outside Jannah with held fire doors still standing open and me standing arguing with you. So I'm going to ask you before I leave right now, please, if I did anything wrong, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And I assure you, I forgive everybody here. If anybody thinks you did anything, no, I forgive you. You forgive me. We forgive each other. Let's go to Jannah and have it done. I mean, I had so much good time to be with all of you, and this program is a great way for us to end that. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahu Akbar.